Once again, men, thank you for listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. I hope you enjoyed this show. All the links mentioned in the intro and in the conversation will be in the show notes. If you would, make sure that you click subscribe to never miss any Pursuit of Manliness podcast content. And as always, I really appreciate when you share this show with your friends, whether your social media feed or you text it to a buddy or email or whatever, just letting them know, hey, this is a conversation that I believe you would benefit from. So men, thank you. Thank you for helping us build better men together. And let's keep pursuing biblical manliness. Well, men, at this time, I want to welcome Stephen McAlpine to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. Stephen, did I say that right to start with? You did. It sounded uh, very Scots-Irish, so oh, that's man. great. Oh, man. I, lo- <laughs> I love you already. Yeah. Hey, uh, man, it's uh, we're going to get into your book, Being the Bad Guys, and certainly that's the, the link in the show notes. But before we get started, would you just take a moment, introduce yourself, who you are, and uh, maybe what led you to, to, to write this book? Yeah, for sure. I, I pastor, well, I pastored a few churches and planted a few in Perth in Western Australia, which is sort of the bottom, as you look at the map, bottom left-hand corner of Australia, very remote, very secular, very wealthy city, um, beaches, sunshine, no one needs Jesus kind of place. <laughs> um, and I've been pastoring there and writing and uh, speaking various things, um, I work for an evangelism organization as well, a part-time called City Bible Forum, which is really looking to link people up in the workplace uh, with the scriptures and helping Christian workers figure out how to live in the current context. But I've been pastoring churches mainly and helping a few churches through some difficulties. So at the moment, I'm a gun for hire in places where there's been a little bit of church trouble at the top of the tree. And I come in as the lead to help them sort out their issues. Um, married to uh, a lady called Jill, and she's a clinical psychologist, and she's very busy because I think she sees the um, the tsunami wave of all of the cultural mess that I preach about. She sees the results of, and uh, we have a couple of kids. One's in ministry. One's a young boy in school. So our daughter's involved in the ch- one of the church plants we worked at, and Perth is uh, my home. Though I was born in Northern Ireland, so I've come from a very fundamentalist Northern Irish background, which is very sheltered. And then being in Perth, um, where I've been a writer and thinker for a long time and uh, involved in ministry, just how you navigate that cultural space. It's been interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a bit of time, you know, I'm a, I'm a runner, so I'd run four or 5,000 Ks a year just to run the crazy off and uh, that kind of thing. So ministry is intense. I'm an introvert, but I found myself in a job where you're required to be <laughs> <laughs> on the stage all the time you might know what i mean <laughs> i know exactly what you mean um not about me though okay so uh you know i i've reached out to you because this book and i the, the notes will be in the, the the show notes here but i was going through amazon recently trying to get my books for 2022 and just okay let's be in, building that reading list and i came across this title and i thought Oh, I'm for that. Let, let's check this out i i can be honest i didn't know who you were or anything i didn't know anything about the book and i got into about the first page and i thought this is different than I was anticipating and it's better. It's better than I, I thought it was just going to be okay being shrewd or kind of being, you know, not being a pushover for a Christian, but you, you talk about this in the introduction. You say, uh, because the only way to stop being a bad guy in the eyes of the world is to become what the world says is a good guy. And right now that means compromising all kinds of areas where the world, um, beckons one way and the Bible points to another. Now, our natural inclination is we don't want to be, quote unquote, the bad guy. Like, I don't want to come across that way. Can you give us some examples of this tension, maybe what you're working through or what led you to write that? Hmm. Yeah, and I th- the big one currently in the culture, clearly in the Western context, is on the sexuality and identity issues around gender. There's no way around that. And what you'll find is uh, if you've got a church framework that rolls over on that and says, we'll just go along with the cultural framework, you get a seat at the table. Yep. But it is the shibboleth moment in the church. And I found as a pastor, many people are asking, what do I do? I'm in a workplace where it's um, Celebrate Diversity Day and I'm in charge of you know, this floor or this department. How do I manage this? And mm-hmm. I say, well, you might not. <laughs> it might cost you your job. But we want to find a way to navigate that well. But also churches are finding that the, 
the secular framework is saying churches, if you just got on board with this identity thing, you'd be okay and we wouldn't come after you. It's only a little thing. It's only a thin slice. You'll be fine. But I think that's a gateway drug. I think that's a gateway drug to further compromise. And we can model to the world what a, an identity formed in Christ and what a, a, a life looks like that doesn't have our sexuality as our primary foundational understanding of identity. I think that's where the culture is at. It's an identity question. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a scriptures that are packed full of how our identities in God, um, don't give that one up. <laughs> we shouldn't be giving any of them up. You're right. You know, we, we, uh, we'll get into it in a minute, but you, you know, we kind of think if we just play nice, we'll get to run parallel to the rest of the, the world. And, you know, you talk about getting a seat at the table or, you know, hmm. shoulder to shoulder in the marketplace, which isn't necessarily true. You talk about, you know, being offered a rival gospel. There's a lot of churches that are saying what they're about and, you know, have all these signs and banners and, you know, and, and websites that say we're, we're for these people, but he says the narrative that seeks to first expose the Christian gospel, it, is as they're trying to expose it as bad news and then replace it with a much needed good news. We've been given the good news, but somehow we've compromised it collectively as, I mean, that's a sweeping statement, but as Christians generally we begin to compromise it. Cause again, we don't want to be perceived as the bad guys, right? That's right. And there's some issues where we've got to take our medicine because uh, some yeah. church, you know, you only have to read the newspapers or the online journals to see um, ungodly leadership, sexual scandal, financial scandal but by and large the average church where people are going um, you're always faced with the compromise issue of will I live like the world and it's not necessarily around sexuality it's where will I find my source of satisfaction and do Christians look weirder than their non-Christian friends I think we spent decades trying to fit in and then the culture just kept shifting and it's to do with money and how our attitudes to giving and how our attitude to service and sacrifice and Carl Truman's book, I, I think my book is probably the, the, the exam notes version of Carl Truman's book um, on the, the rise and triumph of the modern self, mm -hmm. where identity issues are so embedded in our culture as the good news. If you can find out who you are individually and you can self-actualize, mm -hmm. you'll be free and liberated. That's the gospel of our culture, which goes against the grain of self-denial is what right. Jesus calls us to, not self-fulfillment. Jesus says, if you die to yourself, you will live. And the culture says, if you die to yourself, you're, you're an idiot. Yes. <laughs> You've yes. got to be the truest you, you can be. And Christians suck that up just as much as anyone else. And we can be, you know, five-point Calvinist or Wesleyan down to the back teeth or whatever we are in our thinking theologically, and you can be baptized and a member, but you still think like a consumer when you come to church, that what's in this for me? How do I craft my life according to what church, you know, if this church doesn't give me what I want, I go somewhere else or all these sorts of things. And what you find is that our mentality is that we're being discipled Monday to Saturday with a very effective discipleship program that the world is offering us. And a little bit of evangelical light on the surface on a Sunday ain't going to cut it. We're going to have to go deep and rich and thick in the next 30 years, if we're going to arrest that, that's trend. Even with that word gospel, people are for the gospel, as long as it means I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. But when the gospel gets personal and it starts talking about your sin and your repentance and your need, we, we might find a different church that becomes a little more like vacation Bible school for, for grownups, that becomes a little more entertaining a little more mm -hmm. anonymous, less threatening, because that's what the world's offering. You can have anything instantly. And if you don't like it, we'll just move on. And that includes divorces and jobs and even the way we treat our children, et, et cetera, that um, there, there is no, um, I've been buried with Christ. Therefore, I, you know, I, I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. Our culture really struggles with that. And so if you're a church that's trying to preach the gospel and you see a church yeah. down the street, that's just busting at the seams because they're you know, they're running an entertainment. Yeah. That, that's tough. It is tough. And uh, I would say at the, it's a sugar rush uh, yes. uh, in one sense. And sugar rushes, and I'm, you know, I'm a runner, run a lot. <laughs> uh, sugar rushes will get you through the next kilometer. But you better have put the protein and carbs in your body over the last month mm -hmm. if you're going to run a marathon. Uh, a gel halfway through ain't going to cut it. 
And I, I think much of what we've done in evangelical light is to give the sugar rush that touches the felt need. But when you go to the scriptures and Paul is saying, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your bodies. You go, that is anathema to the culture. And in the sense, it's anathema to my first instinct as a westernized person, mm -hmm. because I'm steeped in the marinade of you are your own. And as a Christian, I have to keep laundering that idea out of my life by getting up and reading the scriptures and praying and going into the day going, I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I will glorify God with my body. And that means I will glorify God with my eyes. And I don't always do that. I will glorify God with my wallet. <laughs> uh, I will glorify God with my feet and with the way I speak to my wife. Mm -hmm. And whether I forgive my wife for a slight that she has, how I treat my coworkers. And do you know something? That's tiring yes. and in many ways without the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm 54, nearly 55. And what I notice is that people run out of energy and give up. And I go, and my twin brother is a case in point. He's not a Christian, but he was a Christian at one stage and he packed it in. And I wanted to say, you've only got another 20 years to go. Keep hanging in there. It's the hanging in there. That's the hard bit. But it's what God's called us to, the perseverance aspect. We were just talking about that last night that, you you know, conversations, it's harder for the believer than the non-believer. The non-believer just says whatever they want and without any recourse, they go home and they sleep pretty well because they just, you know, whatever. Where the believer's like, man, I should have been more evangelistic. I should not have said that. Maybe I should, I quoted that verse wrong. Now I've offended them. We're, we're always analyzing this. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've kind of moved towards making it gospel light, gospel easier to digest. You talk about having a, a spot in this free marketplace that one of the things that we've tried to sell is the idea that, you know, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. And you talk about going into the pubs, but often the Christians end up looking more like the people in the pubs than the people in the pubs end up looking more like Jesus, you know? And so yeah, exactly. we put ourselves in a precarious situation. Yeah. Mark Sayers says that in his book uh, and on a podcast. Mark Sayers is a Melbourne pastor, and Melbourne is a very secular, progressive city in Australia. And he planted churches originally in the middle of, you know, we'll go to meet in the pub and things like that. And one woman ended up saying, I ended up being more like the people in the pub than the people in the pub being like me. And he realized that his gospel relevance program or his cultural relevance program had to be taken over by a gospel resilience program. And Mark Sayers says, we need to move from cultural relevance, people aren't interested in us, so we've got to be culturally relevant, to gospel resilience, because they're interested in us in a hostile way. We're no longer just wrong, we're bad and dangerous if we hold to the gospel framework. And that's not just around sexuality, it's around the exclusivity of Jesus, uh, the fact that we are um, aligned to... Uh, a king who is not a king of this age in the same in the way and that's what I, I think I want to see Christians become a little bit more angular without being angrier and by that I mean people look and go whoa that's that's that hits different that hits different yes. I would not join that because that would demand so much of me because the truth is everyone no matter what you are like has to sign a blank check and hand it to Jesus yep. right and he gets to fill in the amount. And for some people, that's about sexuality. For some people, that's about autonomy. For other people, it's about pride or position or anything. And for each of us, it's probably a whole bunch of little things every day because it's the little things every day that it's the little foxes that ruin the grapes. Mm. There's not some great big hundred foot fox coming down the road. It's just little ones right. all over the place that ruin the grapes. And I think as Christian men, it's the little foxes that'll eat out your heart. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it, it's like what God told Cain. Sin is crouching at your door that sin wants to look small and insignificant. And it, it's a slow fade away from, from what is true and what is right. And we were saying recently that maybe instead of telling people what we believe all the time, maybe we should start telling people why we believe this. Because a why is yeah. different than a what. Because everybody in, in our day, whether it's um, your stance on social justice, your stance on vaccinations, your stance on politi politics, whatever, we're all paranoid of each other. But if I tell you why I believe it, maybe that's different. And I think there's some Christians that don't know why they actually believe what they profess to believe. And that's why they 
they really hit that roadblock of, do I take a stand on my faith or do I, do I fold because it's easier just to fold? Yes. And I, I'm putting together a, uh, uh, an apologetics pre-evangelistic course training course at the moment for my, one of my roles. And it's called never more hostile, never more open, but the culture mm -hmm. is hostile towards the gospel. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's shouty and loud, and it feels like it'll just batter you around the ears, especially on social media. But there's an openness too, because people are pulling the lever of the cultural frameworks, and they're not necessarily working. And one of the things I've said to people is look for the issue behind the issue. What is the key issue behind sex? It's about identity. Who mm -hmm. am I and where do I belong? What is the key issue behind science even? It's about meaning and where do I find meaning and, and how, do I, how do we come about? And it's very easy to feel that the surface issue is the issue, but we need to spend a bit of time listening to people and then responding with wisdom. Because at the moment, the more we go blah, 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 loudly on social media, people just haven't listened. And I think if we shout louder, it's a bit like going to you know, Southeast Asia for your holiday and getting lost. And you're wandering around looking for the hotel and you ask someone very in English and they go, not understand English and then you just shout louder and <laughs> you speak English slower and louder thinking that might change it right. and it doesn't right. you've got to say you've got to find a way to get underneath that to actually get you to engage and understand what I'm saying and I think that why question is is critical to it and I think in the last couple we'll get to social media here at the end here but I think was in the last couple of years I don't know about you I'm even tired of seeing post and and stuff from people I agree with. It's almost ad nauseum that you're not going to change anyone's mind by yelling louder or sharing more tweets, screenshots, or YouTube links or whatever. Um, we're just not. We're, and, we're, and as Christians, we're certainly not going to advance the gospel by using the same tactics of the world. The church is built to influence culture, not have culture influence the church. We should be mindful of the times, but it was the church that would go out and, and, and when people, you know, share the gospel and those people then would come in for worship or get to, you know, um, we've lost that. We, we now are, way, we're now having meetings to discuss what the culture is telling us and then thinking, well, what do, how do we respond? Well, maybe we need to get back to what Jesus told us and maybe bring that light into darkness and let the darkness figure out how they're going to respond. Yes. That's, that's a really good point because I'm a, I, I'm a pastor, but I, I think as I see a lot of solutions and something I talk about in the book is that the church is the solution in, in you know, Jesus as King of his church and the church is the solution. It, it isn't that the church needs to change. The church needs to go deeper into Jesus and be that alternate ethical community. That's what I call it. Yes. An alternate ethical community that people look at and go, Whoa, that's, that's very different. It's a different cultural understanding. It doesn't use the weapons of this age because you're right, like Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, they're good things to use. Yeah. But if they are only being used as the flip side of the way the world uses them, then we've, we've lost it. And also you'd realize that we, what's the, there's a report from America about the exhausted majority. There's 10% over here are arguing one argument, 10% over here arguing the opposite argument, and 80% of us in the middle holding our heads down, hoping the missiles don't hit us as they fly over the top. I reckon there's a fruitful field in the middle yeah. of people. If you just listen to them and engaged with them at, at just careful, gentle, but clear ways, have there's a gospel opening there in our culture at the moment because people are looking around going what can i even trust these days yes yes in chapter three uh, binary beige versus diver diverse rainbows which i knew that was going to be a good one once i saw saw the title you yeah. say that our primary concern or ought to be not that our personal lives will become harder nor that our children will have to grow up in a hostile sexual setting nor even that we might lose our jobs because of our faith rather it's that a rapid rejection of this binary understanding of the world will both destroy and be used to destroy those who've been made in the image of god it is a rejection of god himself and you go on to use romans chapter 1 verses 25 to 27 as a reference of you know god's wrath and kind of you know preventing certain things and you actually say that there's there's a there's a positive side to this right you talk about um, that this that the, that this truth can be comforting to Christians. How is this truth 
comforting to other Christians when, you know, it, when I, I got kids, I'm worried about what it could look like for, for them growing up and my grandkids, et cetera. Yeah. Look, I think in one sense, the, uh, the truth works. So that's the other thing. I'm ultimately pragmatic about the truth in this sense, in that it actually works. A life lived uh, with the grain actually looks different over time to a life lived hard against the grain. And um, by that, I mean the way the grain that God has put into us to live. There's a, that's why there's the wisdom literature of the Bible, because if you do this, you know, pull this lever, this will be the result. And if you do things constantly that are against what God has done or against how God has put us together, don't be surprised when you've got a mental health crisis in your country. As I say, my wife is a clinical psychologist and you can say what you like about the sexual revolution, but it's kept us in a nice house because <laughs> <laughs> she is booked out. She's, booked out. <laughs> Every, she's got people on the wait list and yes. for, for months and all of it is to do with, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. And all of the choices I make that were promised to give me liberty are not giving me liberty. And I think you can be confident that as you do church together with Christians who are going, let's live this out in a meaningful way, your kids catch on to that. They, they may stray a little bit or they may be influenced by the Babylon in their back pocket, their phone. But in one sense, it's the deep, thick relationships they form in community that are going to shape them more than anything. Yes. And I think the church has got a great opportunity to be that and to showcase what it looks like living as forgiving, generous, loving people who are holy. Because I think there's something deeply, att repellently attractive, I call it, about that. It's scary, but it's good. <laughs> Amen. I, you know, one of the things that we try to get guys to understand is one address at a time. And uh, it's easy to turn on the, the local television or get on social media or Twitter or whatever and tell the world how bad it is or how this side is so wrong. And, you know, but do your kids know you love them? Does your wife know that you love her as Christ loved the church? And the thing that we don't want, I, I was talking to them last night. I said, you know, what's a great cure for all this minding your own business. So if you can just focus on your own family right now, that might be the starting point. That might be the, because we are, that is a non-negotiable. We are called to love our wives well. We're loved, our children, our daughter-in-law, son-in-laws, whatever. So if, don't you agree with, like, if we just get that address right to start with, that might be the first piece of the puzzle to see some change in, in our world. Well, when it says in scripture, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, that runs against the grain of the, be your own hero, go out there and conquer the world. And Paul says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Well, that's not very ambitious, except if that's how Jesus actually is going to usher in his kingdom through the quiet lives of Christians living in godly ways. Mm -hmm. And you go home, you can write, I can write any sermon I want and say anything I want, but if I go home and I don't love my wife, or I'm bitter because of the way she said something or whatever, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if my yep. kids look at my marriage and think you're a dud in your marriage, dad, and you know, I'm encouraged by my daughter saying all her friends at uni or at school used to bag out their parents because of the way they lived. And she felt like, oh, my parents seem to be okay. And then <laughs> the report, I said, really? You never say that when you're arguing. <laughs> but then there was something out the other day that, um, I read that uh, someone in class was asked how many people in this class, um, a school child, uh, have dinner together more than twice a week. And the only two kids in the class that had dinner with their families together more than twice a week were the Christian kids. And mm. I went, well, we have dinner together five, six nights a week. Yeah. It's just the way we are. And we're going to keep doing that. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like it's a chore. It just feels like that's what, who we are. I think maybe it's those little odd things when your friend, when your child's friend comes home to dinner to your house yep. and goes, I wish they were my parents, yep. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I love that phrase that we're going to keep doing that. And I think that's, that's the conversation we have in our house. Like we're going to live radically different lives than, than maybe the people that uh, go to our church or to our school or whatever. And, and I'm going to be okay with that, you know, cause we're going to, we're not, we don't have it figured out, but boy, we're going to give us a maximum effort to try to get this right. Uh, you know, I, I, before I got on here, I had a text from a guy who was a quote about people playing the victim card. And you had a quote here uh, on page 65. You say, we should not play the game 
where we search for the trump card that grants us an elevated victim status and places us beyond criticism by others ushering in privileges it's not a tactic worthy of those who identify and find worth in christ why are believers so susceptible to fall prey to the tactics of the evil one to become victims uh because seemingly it works because in our cultural framework of intersectionality, the more victim framework you can show, uh, the more um, biscuits you get from, from the culture or uh, biscuits be a scone in Australia, cookies. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, it's not just 11 hours time difference, it's a whole cultural difference yes, yes, <laughs> in yes. the way we speak. Um, but you get a cookie from the culture and you mm. get a seat at the table if you can show that you're a victim. Yet, there's two things there. It's hard to see that we are victims when we are very wealthy. Uh, and even Christians in Australia, which is a much more secular place than in the US, here's something we have. We have Christian schools that are populated only by Christian teachers, funded two-thirds by the government. Uh, hundreds of them, 33% of Australian kids go to a independent school, most of which are Christian schools funded by government and uh, you can hardly go around saying we're a persecuted minority if that's the case now that means a lot of kids are going to schools who aren't christian who are going to christian schools because they're open policy right but we've we've got to be careful with the victim status now i do think that we are being hassled in the yes. media and the public square and there are some very ungodly decisions being made mm -hmm. and people in my church struggle at work when they get hounded because of their views but we're not uh, living in Yemen as a Christian or Afghanistan. And I think we had to be very careful. So what I want us to do is say, a, a great book you should read would be by the foreign affairs editor of our national broadsheet newspaper here in Australia called, uh, the guy's called Greg Sheridan. And he's written a couple of books on Christianity in Australia. And he said, uh, we need to be happy warriors, happy warriors. That in the culture, yes, it's a fight to be Christian in the culture, but there's something about joy that has to be central to who we are, not victimhood or, you know, woe is me, it's more than my job's worth. Um, we have to be the kind of people that go in the midst of all this, because the scriptures say there's great joy, even if, you know, in 1 Peter, even if now you have, it is necessary for you to suffer trials of many kinds, because these trials will test your faith. Perhaps we just haven't had it tested enough. And I do think that America is a little different to Australia, that I think there'll be a more rapid falling away among cultural Christianity in America. Yep. Yep. We don't have... have Christianity and other people would nominally call themselves Christian, but we've always been a little minority in the sense of actual people going to church believing the gospel. So we don't feel like we're victims because we've never had the ascendancy. Um, there's cultural Christianity, but the people who go to church are very small. And uh, I think Australia could probably teach America a few lessons of what your future might look like in 20 years' time if this cultural Christianity in America continues to shrink. You're going to find that the people that are left over are the fully committed people because it's going to get harder to stay a cultural Christian. I don't disagree with that at all. I think uh, I was talking to someone today that just even with through COVID and the lockdowns, whatever, uh, we, we've seen an interesting thing in America, who's come back and who, who expects service online. We kind of turned it into um, a food delivery service type of deal with, when it comes to, to churches. And I think the narrow road has thinned out significantly in American Christianity. However, we're not really persecuted as much as we're just being aggravated or annoyed. And so if you always cry wolf every time something doesn't go your way, when, when it does get, when it does turn and it will probably get worse, it, it, it'll be, you know, falling on deaf ears. So we, we need to go back to what is true, what we believe in the hope that we have and make that our proclamation. You know, as John says, we proclaim this to you. We've seen it. We've heard it. We've touched it. You know, we, it could not be more real to us. And again, I think that's that's the message that Christians need to portray. And your book does a great job of showing what do you do when you're at work and we're all supposed to wear, you know, rainbow T-shirts now, or we're all supposed to sign this this thing. And it, it's easy for you and I to say that. It's hard to walk into those environments, though, right? 
Yeah, look, I, I think um, for me, uh, I, 25 years ago, taking a ministry option in work was the hard option. And now yes. I think it's the, I think it's the slightly easier option because it's a sheltered mm -hmm. workshop because you're not going to have to go through some of the jump, some of the hoops that uh, people in the workplace are going to have to jump. And part, it's different for different groups. I think uh, for white collar workers, it's kind of a, a slow strangulation. Uh, but I've got a big enough family that some of my brothers are um, very blue collar workers <laughs> and farmers. And uh, those situations are very different. Uh, it feels much more confrontational, much more raw. It's almost uh, the cultural, it's an unsophisticated ungodliness in a blue collar setting. And it's a much more sophisticated ungodliness in a white collar setting. And you have to be able to prepare your people for what form of Babylon they're going to get tomorrow morning at work when you're at church on Sunday. Your job is to equip them for Babylon on Monday morning. That's interesting. Uh, I would think it'd be the opposite. The blue collar guys are a little more rugged, a little more, you know, dirt under your fingernails. And, and at least that's been my experience. So I, that's, that's something to really consider there. You talk about here, um, page 74, for many Christians, Twitter and Facebook have become the means to push hard against anti-Christian sentiment. Twitter, Facebook, now there's Getter, Parler. I mean, there's a new one, MeWe, there's a new one every day. Whether from illegal, political, or cultural channels, okay. how much time should we spend doing this? It is all, all that helpful in the tall task of showcasing Jesus. Christians of all people should have no fear of being viewed as wrong. We are not self-justified people. We are jesus justified people so how, what advice do you give us to to utilize these platforms to to the glory of god um the first thing i would say is uh consider every word you write to be a word you say to which you will have to give an account on the last day before mm. the one uh before whom no word falls to the ground <laughs> um that would be the first thing to say the second thing i would say is there's something attractive about being um, slightly uh, quizzical and ironic on Facebook and Twitter without being rude. I think you can be a little bit, uh, you've got to be a bit savvy. It's like they put a loaded gun in a lot of people's hands yeah. who don't know how to shoot. And, and they've put a loaded pen in a lot of people's hands who don't know how to write or how to hold back. And, the less you say on Facebook and Twitter and you carefully think about what you're going to say, the less regret you're going to have tomorrow morning when you take that off Twitter. <laughs> and that just seems like wisdom to me because we're seeing that in the culture generally that many people who are not Christian at all are saying things that they have to delete or saying things that cost them their jobs. Yeah. Christians have to have a little bit more wisdom than that. So I think we can say things on social media, but it's such a bald platform. It's such a non-nuanced way of engaging with people that the slightest um, slip of the pen or the keyboard can be you know, amplified beyond what you intended. And I just think we have to be very careful with that. Uh, Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile again, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly which didn't mean that there'd be no justice. It just meant that it might not be in your timing. <laughs> and we like justice served immediately. And Douglas Murray has written in his book, The Madness of Crowds, and Douglas Murray is not a Christian, that he thinks Christianity is the only safety net in a culture which has no forgiveness if you get mm. something wrong, especially on social media. And I think that's a telling sign that Christians on social media need to temper themselves so carefully because you can go down a rabbit hole and find yourself saying things to people that you'd never say to their face. And they are made in the image of God, those other people. I think we forget we are called to live radically different lives. And that's going to be in the marketplace. That's going to be in our churches. And that's certainly going to be on social media as well. We're not to look like everybody else. We don't have to be a doormat. We can be shrewd as snakes, innocent as doves, but at the end of the day, um, using those things to the glory of God, I, like what we're doing here, using technology to the glory of God, you know, having a conversation that we believe is edifying, hopefully encouraging a lot of people, or you can do the opposite. And I think you can do a lot of damage. And um, 
in the enemy of our soul mm -hmm. is working around the clock, right? To, uh, to try to trip us up, to try to make yeah. us paranoid, a lot of paranoia right now. A lot of people assuming the worst about one another and um, what, so yeah. Stephen, thank you, man. I, I, I know um, we got a major time difference here. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, where can we find this book? How do we get in touch with you and what you're, what you're doing, brother? Well, I'm hoping it's being sold in good bookshops. Uh, That's uh, right. It's interesting. I, my mom, my mom's cousin was in, uh, who I haven't, don't know that well, but she's in uh, California. And I just got a text message one Saturday. Did you write a book called this? Because someone in the conference is talking about it from the front. I said, yeah, that was me. <laughs> uh, so the good, the good Book Company sells it in the US, UK and Australia. And um, I think it's taken up well in the UK and, the, and Australia because I think it's probably a few years away from really hitting its stride, the whole secular thing in the US. But I also blog at stephenmcalpine.com and I blog about these issues in blogs are easier than books, by the way. You can write a thousand words and walk away, but your editor is always on your case about the argument you didn't make in chapter three. <laughs> um, but I think uh, you can contact me there at, at my blog or go through there. Um, and I, I think the, the follow up issue for me, and I think as a pastor, you'll feel this, is many people ask after I wrote that book, what next? What's the next 30 years look like for those involved in ministry? So I'm starting to write some stuff on that. What does the church need to look like in now? How do we have to put the things in place now? That means in 2052, we're a faithful, flourishing church in what I think will be an even harder culture. I think that's a key to me. How do we put things in place now to be prepared for then? It's, you can't take out of the bank what you haven't put in. You better, put the, you better stash it away now. Man, that's good. That's real good. I will say this. Uh, this was my first encounter with you that finding this book. I found it through Amazon. Uh, if you write another book, I'm definitely oh, buying it. I really uh, love your style. And I know the guys that are going to check this out are, are, are going to love it as well. Um, thank you, brother. Thank you for making time. I appreciate you being on the show. And, and I look forward to seeing what the Lord continues to do through you and in, in the ministries that you're a part of. Well, look, it's a very encouraging conversation just to meet people across the miles who think the same frameworks and are going through the same struggles, but seeing the same, having the same confidence that Jesus has this, he's got it sorted and we can have our confidence in him no matter what the culture does. So thanks, Jared. I appreciate it. Amen. Once again, men, thank you for listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. I hope you enjoyed this show. All the links mentioned in the intro and in the conversation will be in the show notes. If you would, make sure that you click subscribe to never miss any Pursuit of Manliness podcast content. And as always, I really appreciate it when you share this show with your friends, whether your social media feed or you text it to a buddy or email or whatever, just letting them know, hey, this is a conversation that I believe you would benefit from. So men, thank you. Thank you for helping us build better men together. And let's keep pursuing biblical manliness. Manliness.